Well, I am honored to be talking with Brian Forster today. Brian is an explorer, biologist, and author of many books, including Lost Ancient Technology of Peru and Bolivia. Brian, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. So, Brian, I've been following you now for over five years, and I'm a big fan of your research, your writings, especially the videos you've been releasing uh, lately over the last couple of years of the elongated skulls and all the megalithic sites in and around Peru and Egypt. Um, and, uh, man, I just am so excited to have you on the this little interview today. And uh, something I really want to highlight in this video is that you are now hosting these awesome amazing uh, guided tours via your website hiddenincatours.com where you take people behind the scenes to these ancient megalithic sites in and around Peru and I'm so personally excited to be joining you this August the 7th through the 16th for the elongated skulls tour and uh, this is a 10-day adventure uh, it's limited to 15 people and for everybody who watching there's eight spots left and so, uh, Brian, I would love for you to give the audience an idea of what they will experience if they come on this tour. And so I kind of want to go through the whole week each day, the, the main stops, and get your take on the awesome sites we're going to see. So um, on day one, we visit uh, Cusco, I believe. Um, please tell us about what we will experience on day one in Cusco, um, especially uh, as we look at the, uh, I believe it's called the Inca Roca Polygonal Wall. Okay, well, Cusco, of course, was the capital city of the Inca people, <clears throat> um, dated by conventional standards of being about a thousand years old. But in the Inca core, and Cusco is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, um, there are megalithic elements there, especially walls, which um, fit, the stones fit so tightly together that you can't fit a human hair in the joints. Um, also, the stone is always very hard stone. It's either granite or basalt. And the Inca were a Bronze Age culture. So the basic thing about cutting stone or shaping stone is the tool has to be harder than the material. The Inca only had bronze tools, and bronze is a lot softer than granite and basalt. So that tells us automatically that they couldn't have done some of the construction in Cusco. Correct. And on your website, you have a picture of this Inca Roca wall. And it's amazing. There's one si uh, stone in there that literally has 10 sides. And um, just talk about that stone real quick. It's amazing to look at. Sure. Well, the, um, the Inca Roca <coughs> wall, which is there are actually three semi-intact walls. The fourth wall was repaired during Inca times. But um, each stone is a different shape and size, and they fit together, again, with incredible precision. There are no straight lines. Each stone is its almost like squishing marshmallows together, and the joinery is not straight like that. There are no, the, the stones don't fit together like this. They fit together in curves, so that further complicates whoever it was that did this construction. We've taken many stonemasons to look at it, and they're just dumbfounded. They don't understand how in the 21st century we could do this work. So that again tells us that the, the Inca found the ruins of an abandoned megalithic city, built it with their basically limited skills. Incredible. I cannot wait to visit Cusco and see these walls. I'm really excited about day two on the tour because that's the day we get to go see the massive walls at Saxe Waimon. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And um, is it true that these walls, the foundational stones, go about 12 feet underground? Yeah, the, the largest stone um, weighs estimated at 125 tons. And again, each stone is a different shape and size. Um, and they did, the archaeologists did, uh, did dig down to see how far down the foundation went. And they found that it goes down 12 feet underground. So that means that this one stone, uh, 17 feet exposed, is 29 feet long. Incredible. Now, I've heard it said 
that some of the oral traditions of the Inca state that when they kind of arrived in the area, or maybe it was the Spanish, uh, was the Inca or the Spanish, basically don't the oral traditions say that when they arrived, they told the Spanish that these were here before we got here? Yeah, the Spanish were absolutely blown away by what they saw, especially at Sacsayhuaman, because you have these two, three tiers of construction of, of these massive megalithic blocks, and the quarry is at least three miles away. Um, and so they turned to the Inca and said, did you build this? And the Inca said, no, this was here when we got here. And that tells us that there were profound constructions done before Inca times. That's one thing I love about your research, Brian, is how you're always researching the oral traditions uh, of the people, which, again, we can pull so much from. On day three of the Elongated Skulls Tour, uh, we get to visit, I think it's pronounced the Hawaro Museum. Is that how you say it? Uh, actually, it's Waro. Waro. So much for my... Uh, my pronunciation of the Waro Museum, and we get to see this, um, and I'll let you pronounce it, the skeleton there at that museum that looks almost alien and humanoid-like. Uh, what? Tell us about the skeleton, what it's called, and, and what genetic features about it would lead you to believe that it's not just human. Well, the skeleton is called Waiki, which means my, my equal in the Inca language. It was found in a royal cemetery on top of a mountain called Wiracochan, which means the mountain of creation. And um, I've taken many doctors and uh, dentists and nurses and anatomists to see it, and all of them are completely blown away. The major feature is that the head is the size of the torso. So no known disease. Um, can explain. It was, it was also taken to uh, a clinic, a big medical clinic in Cusco, and examined by seven doctors, and none of them could figure out what it was they were looking at. It, all of them said, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, we are planning on doing uh, DNA testing, which actually is going to happen right after the tour. Um, a representative from the U.S. is coming down to take samples and take to two of the major labs in North America for DNA study. Incredible. Yeah, I cannot wait to look at this skeleton. Um, I mean, if you see images, it just totally looks out of this world. That will be something amazing to see. On day five, we visit the mysterious cave of, uh, I'll let you pronounce it. What's it called? Um, Is it Napa? Oh, uh, Nyapa Waka. Right, and isn't that the site where there's um, it there's a megalithic, megalithic black stone there that almost looks like it's a, a machine? Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a very obscure place. It took me two years to find it. Um, it's we, we will be climbing about uh, two to three hundred stairs up through Inca terracing, and it's located in a, in a cave. There's a false door, which is this depression about the size of a refrigerator. And then there's also this altar-like thing. And it's super hard stone. Uh, it doesn't look anything like anything the Inca ever did. So nobody can really understand, um, archeologically speaking, what it is and who made it. But it's, it's, it's almost like being on a Star Trek set. Yeah, that to me is one of the most incredible megalithic sites in Peru. Uh, I mean, just the appearance of this thing looks like a literal ancient machine. Can't wait to see that. I think also on day five, we're going to uh, the Alan Tayambo site. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, Alan Tayambo is, is one of the biggest of the uh, Inca sites. It's almost as Machu Picchu is bigger, but it's, I think, 600 acres in size. It uh, contains massive Inca period. Uh, terraces, but then there's a construction on top of the hill, which is a row of six megalithic blocks weighing 60 tons each, and the quarry is across the valley on top of a mountain. So 
Again, it's an example of something that the Inca found when they discovered Ointe Tambo. And that's the, that's the basic case is whenever they found something mysterious like this, they would build their constructions around it because they were in awe of whoever it was, <clears throat> excuse me, who had pre uh, preceded them. Incredible. On day six, um, your tour says that we take a train to Machu Picchu. Um, tell us a little bit uh, about what it's like to ride this train into the city. This has got to be incredible. And then um, what secrets, what will people uncover and see and learn with their own eyes about this amazing city that the most, maybe the general public doesn't know? Well, it's a, it's a great, uh, this will probably be my 61st trip or something, <laughs> but it never, it never loses its appeal because it's, uh, it's of course, world, world uh, known. Um, it's the most famous ancient site in South America. Uh, and the train ride by itself is great because it's an hour and a half and it goes, it goes downhill all the way. So we go from an area which is agricultural with, uh, with trees um, in the highlands of Peru and we descend into the, into the high jungle. So the climate at Machu Picchu is basically like Hawaii. It has the same smell incredibly full of vegetation. Uh, then we take a half hour bus trip that takes us up to the top of the mountain. And that's where we explore the lost city of the Inca for more or less the entire day because it's, it's massive in scale. Yeah, and this is one of the most probably photographed places in the world. And, you know, it's obvious, you know, in most pictures that I've seen growing up of this incredible city is, you know, the Inca stonework, but again, from watching your videos and uh, seeing the photographs, it's literally shocking to see the foundational stones of Machu Picchu and how it's a totally different construction, more advanced. I mean, you've got these same megalithic stonework that almost looks like they were marshmallows there at Machu Picchu. And that to me is one of the incredible things um, about visiting this place is that's never talked about. Yeah, it isn't. The, uh, the tour guides, conventional tour guides are not allowed to talk about anything that is not um, approved by Western archaeologists. So that's where I'm out of the box because I don't have to answer to, to anybody. Uh, but what you'll clearly see is that the, the core part, the original part of Machu Picchu, which makes up 5 to 10 percent of it, is megalithic. And again, the precision of the construction is profound. We'll also see evidence that there was a massive cataclysm that happened there, the same cataclysm that destroyed megalithic Cusco. And then you'll see where the Inca added on top. The difference in construction technique is night and day difference. So excited about this. On day uh, eight, we get to visit the Paracas Museum and see these legendary elongated skulls um, that you have all of your videos of. Uh, tell us a little bit about what we'll experience at the Paracas Museum and especially I'd like to know even now, what genetic anomalies will people behold when they look at these skulls um, that make them so intriguing? Well, yeah, we have about 40 of them. Um, I believe we're going to the Ica Museum as well, which has really profound ones. But we have about 40, and I'll, I'll show the difference between what head binding or cranial deformation is with ones that appear to have been born with elongated skulls. Uh, so we're likely looking at uh, a subspecies of humanity that died out 2,000 years ago. We've done initial DNA testing, and so far uh, the haplogroups associated, which is the genetic ancestry of these people, is not Native American. So Native American people will have the haplogroups either A, B, C, or D. That's anybody of Native origin living in Central, South, or North America. But those haplogroups have not shown up in the Paracas. Um, also one which we'll see, which is a baby, um, it was examined much more rigorously uh, by this one geneticist, and he found segments of DNA that don't match anything known to be human. Incredible. On day 10, uh, we get to fly over 
the Nazca lines and the incredible geoglyphs there. Uh, tell us a little bit about what this experience will be like getting in a small aircraft and uh, what we can expect. Well, the, the, the flights now are usually, uh, some, some of them carry four people plus the pilot and co-pilot, uh, and there are other one, newer ones now that, are, that carry 12 people. It's a, it's a little more stable because um, for, for filmmaking and taking pictures, the bigger planes allow you to take much better shots. Uh, the little ones are more maneuverable. Uh, mo all of the pilots that fly these planes are ex-military uh, jet fighter pilots, so you, you, it's not like <clears throat> like some guy bought a plane and it's going to fly you. This is it's heavily regulated by the government, uh, very safe, and uh, it's 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 just amazing to be able to be able to see these in person from the air because they cover I think at least a hundred square miles. So everyone is always blown away by the experience of actually seeing the Nazca figures and the lines that go off into the horizon straight as an arrow. Uh, you'll see the famous astronaut uh, and the spider and the hummingbird. Um, and it's, um, it's truly, a, there are other geoglyphs in other parts of the world, but nothing as profound as in Nazca. And I've read where you say um that you believe the Nazca lines were created by two cultures. Um, and this was really so intriguing to me. You say that you believe, one, the Nazca people uh, created a lot of these Nazca lines, but prior to the Nazca, you say the Paracas people who had the elongated skulls also created them. Uh, please talk about that just real quick. Yeah, well, people try to, f try to find one theory that explains the Nazca lines, and none of them, none of the theories work uh, by themselves. So that's why I wrote a book about Nazca, because it depended upon when the creation of the, of the lines was being done. They were made between 500 BC and 500 AD, so that's a thousand years of construction. So you had the Paracas people first. They made the more my mysterious ones. You have anthropomorphic characters of uh, people with antenna coming out of their heads, uh, archaeologists agree that the famous astronaut, which is the figure with the hand up in the air, was made by the Paracas. We'll also see the candelabro, which is a, a trident shape, 500 plus feet tall. Um, and what most people don't know is that the Nazca did the famous ones like the hummingbird and the, the monkey, um, the dog, the condor, the most famous ones, but um, they made about probably 25 to 30 of them. But in the area of Palpa, which is in between Paracas and Nazca, there are more than a thousand of them, smaller, but they're much more bizarre. And that's, uh, that's why it, it's good to take the extended flight and do fly over Palpa as well, because you'll just be in awe and you'll do nothing but click with your camera. I'm gonna have to buy a, a new camera for this trip. So. Uh I might have to get some of your ideas on that. I'm so excited, Brian, about joining you on the Elongated Skulls Tour. Uh, any last words on uh, why people should join us in August for this trip? Well, it's to look at photographs, to read books, to look at videos is, is good for information, but there's nothing like the actual experience of being in the field. So being able to see the megalithic works yourself, uh, are, we, we tend to have very intelligent people come with us from diverse backgrounds and diverse countries. So all of the discussion and stuff is done in the field. We don't bother with lectures and stuff in the evening. It's all uh, tactile contact, discussions with each other. Uh, I, I like to learn from the guests as much as, as try to teach. So it's always a very interactive experience and my wife and I only do this on a limited basis. We don't want to turn this into a, some kind of big business, uh, but we we always enjoy having people from all over the world come in and see this stuff firsthand. Well, I'm so excited. You know, it's one thing I would tell everybody watching, it's one thing to go to a, a, an incredible country like Peru and visit and, you know, go on a tour with a tour guide, uh, but what we're going to get behind the scenes with one of the foremost experts in Brian who lives there, 
who knows the areas nobody else knows. Uh, we're really going to get our money's worth. So um, go to hiddenincatours.com to learn more about this trip. You just click tours and it'll give you a, an option of different ch uh, tours to choose from. The one we're talking about is the elong Elongated Skulls Tour in August. So it's got all the information there. And also uh, hiddenincatours.com is just an amazing resource to bookmark. Ryan has um, articles to read for free often, um, links to his YouTube channel with all these amazing videos, as well as links to uh, books you can buy, extended videos he's made that you can buy. So check that out, hiddenincatours.com. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you and the others in August. Hey, me too. If you've got the money, um, join us. Uh, the trip is um, about $3,400 and includes most of the expenses, um, and I believe the deposit and the rest of the down payment are due by July 1st. Correct, Brian? That's right. All right, so hopefully we'll see you in August. It's going to be amazing. Thanks, Brian. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you.